Welcome to session two of Winter School. This is the first technical topic on ethics and governance. We're going to be looking at module two. My name's Courtney Clowes. I'm actually one of the authors of Ethics and Governance. I've been an editing author for that subject since its existence about uh, seven or eight years ago. And I'm also an author for SMA and uh, GSL and a couple of the others as well. So why do I want to focus on module two? Well, module one is quite short and sharp, not too tricky. And module two has some philosophical concepts that can be a little bit difficult. So we jump into module two and because it doesn't hurt to, to read ahead. And then we come back to it in week three of semester so that when you hear it again, you go, ah, oh, I'm a bit more prepared for that. So it's a, a way to just get you thinking, prepare you for semester. It's a short semester. We want to keep you on track. So tonight's session is on are you ethical? And, and what's interesting here is a lot of people have their own ideas of what's right and wrong. They can't explain them very well and they don't understand why they clash with other people sometimes. So Chris on Saturday afternoon talked about how to get through the program. And we have a philosophy of mastery. So we have mastery, we have different types of resources to help you along. And we also try and work hard to keep you on track. So we work through the materials systematically. Ethics and governance, significant fail rate. Uh, you'll see the number uh, pops up here, you know, 58% are passing. That means a good 40, um, well, it's a little bit higher now, about 38% failed last time. So that's jumped a little bit. But the, the reality here is a lot of people don't read the study guide to the end or don't do enough preparation. So we want to make sure you stay on track and learn the materials. So the first question that I asked you to prepare an answer to is, is it ethical or acceptable just because something is legal? Now, research into uh, accountants has shown that a lot of accountants equate ethics with legal. Oh, if it's legal, I can do it. Uh, I'm going to help someone with their taxes. They're kind of evading their taxes, but there's a legal loophole. It's legal, therefore it's ethical. That's how I'm going to go about it. Now, that's slightly problematic, and uh, we explore this in a little bit more detail. So my question to you, if you want to use the chat box, you're welcome. Some weeks we use the chat box, other times I'll keep it quiet. But the question is, is something ethical if it's, if it's legal? If it doesn't break the law, it must be okay. Anyone want to chat? I'm not seeing anyone typing yet, but I'll, I'll leave that open to you. If you want to share your thoughts with the group, that would be that would be great. We're just about to publish a new clip in Module 2, and it talks about uh, the outsourcing of tobacco production from first world countries to third world or developing nations, as they're called now. And there's a report on child labour in Malawi, and that's what this clip is about. And it talks about it being legal to outsource this production, to getting children to do the work. So this kind of work used to happen in, in Victoria, in Australia, got moved overseas and from the United States moved overseas because kids are cheaper. You can pay them a few cents an hour or a few cents a day. Uh, they don't have to wear any protective gear. I mean, they get poisoned and sick and that's problematic, but it's legal. So big corporates with accountants running financial numbers uh, come to this type of situation. And uh, sometimes this is it's not as clear cut as saying this is bad or this is good, because in some countries, so, so in Malawi, Malawi it might be tobacco, but in uh, somewhere like Bangladesh, it might be textiles and, and clothing manufacture. Yes, they don't get paid very much, but it still lifts them a little bit further out of poverty. So, there's economic cycles, there's the developing nation towards more developed, uh, lots of tension here. And, and a few people have posted, which is great. Yeah, it's, it's not necessarily the right situation, but it's, it's very interesting how many accountants will just say, if it's legal, I can do it, and if not, I can't. And sometimes something that's prohibited or illegal is actually the right thing to do. If we think about some countries and cultures, you actually have to go against what the stated law is. To, to stand up and, and the right thing. So how do we want to uh, encourage you along here? What we've got here is a um, the, the fail rate tends to move between 38, 41%. And I don't want to scare you because I think with hard work and systematic study, you should be able to get through. But a lot of students say, oh yeah, ethics and governance, it's, it's nice and easy. Reading the study guide often isn't very complicated, but getting through the exam is. And so what we want to do is give you a structure and system for, for keeping on track as you start the CPA program. And from there, what we do with our practice exams, our practice exams, we've mapped them to scaled scores. So we can quite confidently predict if you are most likely to fail 
or do well, or if you're somewhere in the middle. And if you're somewhere in the middle, we'll encourage you to just do that extra bit of study to get over the line. And if you're really looking poorly, we'll encourage you to defer your studies because we don't want you to go into an exam completely underprepared. So we help you keep on track and give you clear feedback about what you're up to. So more in the chat box tonight because I want to make sure you're, you're active in, in considering some of these things. What should Jamie do? Take a moment to, to read that. While you read that, some OMS posted ethical behaviour tries to implement higher standards than just being legal. And that's exactly right. So one of the things we talk about is the law sets a minimum benchmark that you must not go below. But ethics sets a top level benchmark about what we should aspire to, what is best. So we want to go past just obeying the law to this idea of aspiration or what we ought to do, where we should be going. So Jamie's asked uh, if the company holds a license. The financial controller laughs and said that would be a waste of time. We just It's just like downloading music, downloading movies. Why pay for it when you can just install it and, and use whatever access code you need to solve the problem? What should Jamie do? Uh, waiting for people to, to post what should happen. And it's interesting because in accounting, most of the ethical issues are actually quite clear cut. There's right and there's wrong. But there's tension because the benefits of doing what is right are low and the, the cost compared to doing what's wrong is, is very difficult. So people don't seem to want to post at the moment. That's fine. As you, during semester, you'll see most people get more and more confidence and they, they start chatting away. But what we have here is <laughs> Luigi's just posted he shouldn't, but he'll be fired. And, and look, that's pretty much where we're hinting at. So first day at work. Jamie's been asked to break the law, cheat and do what's wrong. So your very first work experience and you're asked to compromise your ethics. Now, Jamie might be quite happy to do it because he does this stuff all the time or he might feel quite challenged, but Jamie is in a lower power position. This is what I mean by most ethical dilemmas in accounting are reasonably obvious. It is obvious what Jamie should do. Jamie should refuse unless there's a proper license. It's simple, but Jamie will probably be fired or ignored or never respected ever again. So he'll be ostracized because of this. Um, Laura suggested encouraging them to buy the required license. Exactly. No, I'm not going to do that. I encourage you to, to get the license if this is the right thing to do. Then the financial controller will either say, go away and don't be an idiot, or you're wasting my time, or you're fired, whatever it might be. But that's the cost of being ethical. That's why it's so hard, because you're ethical um, until the first challenge comes your way and then trouble trouble arises. So what will Jamie do? Most people have pretty much picked that up. Uh, Jamie's in a lower power position situation. Someone's identified that. Um, trying to explain the risk of being illegal, but Jamie's scared of being fired, so might just sacrifice his ethical principles and get on with it. So then the next question is not what would Jamie do, but what would you do? You don't have to type here, but really. And, and the reality here is it, it doesn't take much to, to put the right kind of pressure on people to, to make them do exactly what you want. And, and we see this. So if, if you've been following the news in the last two years, 7-Eleven in Australia has been underpaying its um, the staff and the franchisees, underpaid by 50%. So did head office know about it? Yes, they did. Did anyone do anything about it? No, they didn't. So accountants in head office said, oh yeah, we all knew it was going on. We all knew about the payroll fraud. So we're looking at, you know, not just unethical, but totally illegal. We all knew about it, but we didn't do anything about it because that would have been uncomfortable for us. So, uh, so yep, Jamie will install the software. So the next thing I, I want to show you here is what we've given you is an ethical dilemma, and that's what's going to come up in module two. And then what you've got to be able to do is address this in a structured, systematic way. So if you go into an exam and you just say, um, Jamie should do this or Jamie should do that, you're going to miss out on marks because you want to draw out all the threads here. So uh, are someone doing, yeah, um, in the position to try to convince the managers? That, that's right. So you, you would try your best to influence and you either got to stand firm or you decide, is this issue worth debating? So the question is, are there any rules, regulations or codes that would help you evaluate this? And the answer is yes, there is. The Accounting Code of Ethics, APS 110. 
there's a philosophical theory there's AP, um, I think it's APS GM40 as well not APS it's just GM40 it's a guidance note and that helps uh, review things as well so we have the AAA model as a step-by-step -step approach that would help us evaluate this. so if you get a dilemma like this you then have to systematically write your answer step by step come to a conclusion explain your options and then you then you've got your answer and that's why uh, when I sent the email out, practice handwriting your answers, practice typing your answers. A lot of students get to the CPA exam and they go, oh, that was so tough, so much tougher than anything I've done. And you say, well, how many practice questions did you actually do? And how many did you write answers to? And they go, oh, none. I just read the book, read the question, read the answer. Well, if you want to practice for your exam, you have to practice for your exam. And that means writing out answers, going step by step so that it's like uh, building mental muscle memory so that you can move quickly on your way through. So what we do each week, we send out a reminder email and a, and a preparation email. So you get this preparation email that says, go and watch these videos. And we normally say watch it first because then you've got a picture in your mind and a story in your mind. Then read the study guide. And, and what we find is students say, when I read the study guide after watching videos, I get it, it, it sinks in faster. Then we give you questions to do. And as I said earlier, make sure you prepare a written answer. So I asked the question, is it ethical or acceptable if it is legal? It's one thing to say yes or no or maybe. It's another to write two clear paragraphs. It's actually harder than it looks. And so when you get to an exam, if that's the first time you've tried to write an answer, you're going to struggle. And, and I can't help. Uh, people, we, we convince a few people to give this a go and we give you written answers in your practice exams to, to really attempt this. And about 70 or 80 percent of people give that a go, but the other 30 percent don't. Someone said, yeah, what about internal policies? That's a, I'd forgotten that. And I will have a safeguard slide shortly, but yes, internal policies, um, a whistleblower policy, an angle to, to someone to report to, uh, an audit committee, all of those might be a good opportunity as well. So each week you get an email that says, watch, read, attempt, we give you extra questions, we give you test questions, we talk about them in the webinar so you can build your knowledge. And then by the time you come to the webinar, you should be prepared and ready for that, that topic. So keep your eye out for those, those weekly emails. If you're not seeing them, check your spam folder and items like that. Oh, there you go, we'll email it to you each week. We normally email it the day after the webinar. So if you miss the webinar, you get a reminder that says, oh, here's this recording, off you go. And we send a weekend reminder as well. It just says, you know, have a look at these things on the weekend, set aside some time. So, so the key here is just this discipline study. You've got 10 weeks, so it's a bit like a, a marathon. You start, and, and if you wait too long to really get moving, you'll run out of time. So log into the main course. If you haven't been in there already, you go to the main course and you'll see a bunch of resources, the introductions, Winter School will be there now as a unit. Uh, you'll see these short videos. So watch the short videos. They don't take very long. And hopefully that makes studying a little bit more bearable because you get to consume the content like watching TV rather than just straight reading. This is the timetable for ethics and governance for this semester. You'll see we start week one. And because we have our webinar on a Monday night, we literally start on the first day of semester. So we want to hit the ground running because we, we do two weeks per module. And that gets you pretty much the end, on that week, 9th of October, is when people's exams start that Saturday. So what we want to do is give you structure throughout. So you make a pledge, then you do a study plan, schedule your practice exams. You get to choose when you want to sit them, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, and any time of day you can sit that practice exam. And then that way you get the feedback when you want it, when you feel ready. We'll do a mid-semester test. This is only open for a couple of days, and we want to um, give you good feedback, middle of semester, either confidence that you're doing well, or a bit of a, a rocket to push you along if you're falling behind. Then the practice exams get available. We want you to sit the first one before the late deferral date, because if you're not up to speed, you may as well defer rather than lose you know, over $1,000 and have to re-enroll again. And you can see the module ratings as we go along, uh, between 15 and 25%, but we still spend about two weeks each on, on each of these topics. So if you ever have a question and you want to get me or one of my support team, eg at knowledgeequity.com.au, we'll get you a, a pretty rapid response. So that's how you, you keep in touch with us. Uh, the mid-semester exam, similar format to the practice exam, but only multiple choice and a little bit shorter. It'll probably be module one, two, and a little bit of module three, because we'll, 
the module three we start on the Monday, but the mid-semester test will be available that weekend. So module one, module two, probably half of module three. And uh, what, what we find is some students are too scared to do it. Uh, you've got nothing to lose. We don't care if you get a good mark or a poor mark. It's all about feedback for you. So through this semester, we map ourselves to the subject objectives. Why? Because you're examined 100% on that study guide and it's open book. So everything we teach is linked to the study guide objectives and that's how your exam is built. So here are all of them. I'm not going to talk through them all tonight. I'll do that in week one. But this is module one here. Objectives one and two, what's it going to be a profession? Then ethics from their governance and from governance different stakeholders and then corporate social responsibility. So you can see the first uh, one is linked to module one, the next one module two, then objectives four, five and six, more like module three and four, and module eight is module five. So as you do each of the modules, you'll tick off these objectives and this is the foundation of your exam. So what I want to look at tonight, as I should have said, is I'm jumping straight into ethics and professional judgment. We'll cover off on objective one and two, the accounting profession in week one and two. And it's, I don't think it's very complicated and the study guide is very short there. I want to work on the tougher stuff now to get you familiar with it. So a couple of examples here. And, and the question is, why do people disagree with me when it's something ethical or not? Um, Americans are very different to Australians, who are very different to Chinese, who are different to Africans, who are different to Europeans. We have a very different approach to how we do life. And so, for example, in America, property rights are hugely valued. People defend their property and their rights much more strictly than in a communal based society where everyone shares a little bit more. So how do we uh, transfer right to life and compare that against property rights? How do we make that decision? And we'll investigate that more in future weeks. How do we evaluate whether the consequences are important or the intention? So you might have heard the phrase, the end justifies the means. So do whatever it takes to get the right outcome. Is that appropriate? Is that acceptable? Some people say yes, some people say no. And then I talked earlier about obeying the law. Is it appropriate to obey the law all to, at all times or does that not automatically make things legal? So, overview of module two. What I want to do tonight, give you a picture of module two, give you some key stories, especially with the philosophical model, so that when you come to reading it, you will feel stronger, more comfortable with it and move from remembering it to being able to evaluate and apply and answer difficult questions. So module two starts with what is ethics? From there, it talks about different ethical theories. So tonight we're gonna to go through each of these theories for a couple of minutes. We're gonna look at teleological and deontological. You might not have heard those words before. We look at egoism, utilitarianism, rights, justice, and virtue. So if you can see all of them, you can see we've got a little flow chart here or a mind map. You can just have one single page with these notes, with notes attached, and you're ready for any question on the topic. Then code of ethics, we'll touch on tonight, and we spend a good uh, 40 minutes, and, and we work through practical scenarios, a bit like what happened to Jamie, but in even more detail. And you, you pardon me, you learn to use the code of ethics to solve the problem. From there, we go to uh, how to make good ethical decisions. So we look at structure and decision making and how it's influenced. And then we use models, the AAA model, the philosophical model, the conceptual framework model from APS 110, the code of ethics. And what this does is it gives us a systematic, logical way of asking and answering ethical dilemmas. So when we get to ethics uh, module two, can anyone remember what the percentage weighting of module two is from the timetable slide I up earlier? Anyone want to take a guess at it? What's the weighting for module two? 20%. Exactly. So there's 20%. And what we've got is uh, we've got six objectives and 20% of your exam. So your exam is going to be worth, there's me drawing them out. Your exam's got 85 marks. 20% of those marks, roughly 16 or 17 marks, will be based on these objectives. So what you need to do is say to yourself, can I? So turn it into a question. Can I explain professional and business ethics? And if you put that at the top of the page and then you try and write what you know, if the page is still blank after five minutes, you know you've got to go back and read it. But you might be able to write 
two or three lines. And in six weeks time, you try again, you can write 10 lines. Then we talk about philosophical approaches. So teleological, deontological. Can you talk about virtue and character? Can you talk about consequences and intention? Then you can do that. Can you talk about APS 11 Do you know the fundamental principles? There's five of them. Do you know the threats to the principles and the safeguards? If you can do those things, then you can answer questions. And that way you can effectively say, well, 18 questions, there'll probably be two here, maybe four here, five or six here, three more here, and two marks there. There's 18 marks. Can I do all of that? Yes. I'm confident I'm going to get 15 or 16 out of 18 or something like that. So that's how we we break down this big exam, three and a quarter hours, 85 marks into these small pieces, and we just sign them off. We say, I understand that. Now I'm moving forward. So tonight I want to spend most of my time here. Having said that, uh, a brief introduction oh, on objective one. You'll see this uh, picture a lot. And, and the key here is a lot of people end up being puppets on the street. They have no control of their actions. They are manipulated by others. They are so worried about their self-interest. They're so worried about how things go that they'll do whatever it takes uh, and they end up being a problem. So what is ethics? One of the first questions, one of the first objectives you get is describe ethics. So can you describe it? Now the short definition that you're given in the study guide is this concept of determining what is right and wrong. And there's a little addition to that. Uh, sometimes in ethics, you have to choose between two right options where, where both things are good, but you can only have one over the other. And that can be very, very difficult. But in ethics, most of the time, what is right, what is wrong? Should Jamie install the software or refuse? Should you help someone cheat on their taxes or refuse? Should you publish misleading reports or should you refuse? So determining what is right and wrong. So then we get this situation going, well, what about ethics in the workplace? What about business ethics? What about professional ethics? Where uh, are, are your ethics different? When you get up in the morning, you're one person. By the time you walk into the office, do you then go, okay, now I'm at work. I'm thinking like an accountant. So, you know, and I mentioned tobacco in Malawi. You know, I'm going to outsource tobacco manufacture to Malawi. I'm going to outsource textile production to Bangladesh. I'm going to... Um, you know, in Victoria, you know, I'm going to hire some people at 7-Eleven and pay them half what the legal rate is because I can get away with it and that will make me more money. So what we want is professional ethics, application of ethical principles with an obligation to who are professionals, this idea of public service, doing something valuable for society. And then how should we behave? There should be a predictable, appropriate way for behaving. So that objective one has only got a couple of pages in the study guide. And, and there's a new clip we're about to launch uh, tomorrow into the into our system that, that delves into this in a bit more detail. So objective two covers quite a bit more, seven to ten pages of the study guide, and that's the bulk of what I want to cover now. So we start off with normative theories. Now, if you remember these from your undergraduate study, normative norms, how we should behave normally, what is the thing we ought to do. This is the aspiration of where we're aiming, not how we act, but how we should act, how we ought to act. So these ethical theories are trying to describe the best way to behave, but there's no single best way. There's different people's philosophies. So the first set of philosophies are focused on consequences. And what they're saying here is what is good, what is right, what is ethical, is the one that has the best consequences. So we don't really care about how we get to the outcome. We only care about the consequences of the outcome. And that's teleological. The first example of this is ethics based on self-interest, egoism. So you've heard of ego, the self, right? So teleological is consequences and egoism is the self. So we want to say, if this gives me, myself, a good result, it must be ethical. So the first sort of ethical philosophy is one that maximizes your personal net benefit. Companies think like this a lot. Companies go into business and they, their aim is to make profit. They're not there to help their competitors. They're not there to help the government. They're not really there for anyone else but make profit. They are maximizing net benefit for themselves. And that's good most of the time until they start infringing on other people or doing dishonest, uh, dodgy behavior. So ethical egoism means 
something right if it increases my benefit, my own personal self too. Now, one of the problems with that is people don't always play within the rules. People will cheat and manipulate to boost their own self-interest. That's not really what we want to see. What we want to see is boundaries which restrict that self-interested behaviour. So people don't go too hard, don't go too crazy, and so that we have a, a civil society. So if you are willing to restrict your behaviour to say, I'm going to play within the rules, but go for my own self-interest, once again, this is how business behaves we have something called restricted egoism. So if you're asked a multiple choice question in an exam, it's not what do you think is ethical, it might be from a restricted egoism perspective, which of the following are ethical. So number one, you need to understand the theory, and number two, you need to apply it to a particular set of case facts. So I hope that makes sense. Now we shift from the self to the people, to the greater good, for more people and governments normally take this kind of focus. So utilitarianism is the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So the maximum benefit. Now that could be monetary, but it also could be happiness or you know food and prosperity and all these others uh, other concepts. So if if you think of utility utilitarianism, it's the consequence of an action is the thing that is the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And in Australia, um, we're building some some toll roads and we're building some roads and we're building some train tunnels. Now that's going to hurt the environment in some areas, but people said, oh well, small pain to the environment, greater good to more people who want to um, travel around. In China there was discussion about damming the Yangtze River. So okay, a couple of million people were displaced, they lost their homes, but tens of millions of people got access to water and electricity. Now if you're one of a couple of million who lost their home, you might say that's not very fair. So how could this decision be made if it's unethical? Well, because from the greatest good perspective, it is the right thing to do. So sometimes a government might be doing something that looks unfair or unethical to the individual, but is good for the majority of people. Yeah, so like the new citizenship rules uh, is a great example. So vaccination, we'll look at vaccination in a couple of weeks. Forcing people to vaccinate when they're worried that they'll hurt their kids might make them feel infringed upon. Yeah, that's not fair. But from a government perspective, the more people that you immunise, the greater the herd immunity, the greater the benefit. So that's why we can get tension between someone who's pursuing their own self-interest and someone who's pursuing everyone's self-interest. So uh, these question marks, if you see these three questions, this is where it's like, okay, I've talked about teleological for a while. Here's your chance to, to use the chat box to say, I really didn't understand that, or could you give me an example, or whatever. If you'd like to share something that you've experienced at work, that's fine too. Just don't name any names if it's negative. Um, so that question box is there. I'm going to keep on going, but if you have a question, theological, uh, I'll allow So then we move from the consequences to the motive. What is the right thing to do in this situation from an intentions uh, point of view? So we use the word deontological, and rights theory falls under this category. So uh, what we have is all these different types of rights. Uh, for example, we've got human rights, freedom of speech, or the, the right to free speech, uh, property rights, uh, the right to, to say what you feel versus the right not to be harassed and abused. So you can see there's this tension between people because when humans get together, they tend to cause trouble. Two people uh, buy a house and, and they live next to each other. One of them wants the right to listen to whatever music they like really loud. And the other one wants the right to have peace and quiet. How do you sort it out? Well, you normally have to call the police and go and bang on the door, and then you hate your neighbours and it's very awkward. So how do we resolve that? And so government often has to step in and adjudicate those kinds of situations. So the right theory is an example. Then we get to the concept of justice. And what we want here is what is the fairest process? So distribution is like teleological. How much food did everyone get? How much money did we share around? Whatever it might be. But process is deontological, like the, the intention, the desire, the motivation for that to happen. So what's the fairest process of distributing all the benefits and all of the burdens of what's happening in society? So how do we make sure everyone you know, gets a chance? And we talk about fairness in terms of equality. Is it equal? Or do we talk about merit? Or do we talk about need? And, and so an example here might be, uh, 
you've got to feed 10 people and you've, you've got a big pizza. Now, should everyone get one tenth of the pizza? And a lot of people say, yeah, that, that's good, that's fair. But then the next thing is, what happens if four people worked during the day and six people sat on, sat on their butts and watched TV? Uh, and those people who worked bought the pizza. How would you distribute it then? Should it still be one piece each for the 10? Or should the people who worked harder get all of the reward or most of the reward? Then we have needs approach. So imagine it's a family and some of the people who could work did, but a couple of them aren't able to work as much. So they're, they're hungry, but they're, they're too young to work or they don't have the skill or the ability. So should we share it one tenth each? Or should we share it, you worked hard till you get some? Or should we share it based on you have the greatest need, so here is more for you? And the answer is, there is no correct answer. <laughs> the answer is, it depends. And if you think about uh, communism and socialism, this kind of perspective uh, takes, sort of takes up. If you think about sort of the Western individualistic society where it's based on merit and outcome, then we look at this type of perspective. And then if we look at, uh, for example, Australian culture, is actually a hybrid of, of these. So what we have is everyone's supposed to work and if you work hard, you get a great job and you get paid more money, but we still pay taxes and that gets redistributed based on need. Some people are disabled and they can't work. Some people are old and retired, so they get supported. Some people are too young to work, so they get support um, on top of people getting rewarded for merit. So mostly merit, but also what we call a safety net. For those who need help. Now, if you go to America, this gets much more emphasis and this gets much less. So different cultures have different weightings in terms of their justice and their distribution in this situation. So could you not just write about your own perspective? So most Australians, most people studying the CPA program are here. You wouldn't enroll in a program to increase your accounting skills, to increase your employability, to have a better career. If at the end of all of that hard work, you went back to saying, oh, everyone should just get paid the same. <laughs> because some people work harder, smarter, faster, and more disciplined. So you want some reward for your effort. So that's where most people sit. But you need to be able to evaluate an ethical dilemma from different perspectives and say, using the needs perspective, I think this, or focusing on a merit principle, this is what's fair in terms of the process and the distribution. So justice for whom and how, these are the concepts you need to be aware of. Finally, we get to virtue ethics. And virtue ethics is, looks at what are the different key uh, virtues. So what I'll, someone's just asked the difference between utilitarianism and justice based on equality. So there's gonna be overlap there, but one of the key things with utilitarianism, the focus is purely on the outcome. And it doesn't really matter if it infringes on people or how it got there. So it's the consequences focus. Whereas equality also looks at, did we have a fair process? Was everyone equally involved in making this decision? But if, if you had equality that also was the greatest good for the greatest number, you could tick on utilitarianism and justice theory together. But one is more focused at the outcome, the greatest good for the greatest number, the other one is more about, did we share this around equally with everyone? The other thing there with equality is, equality respects uh, minorities. So if, if you're in a society and there's only 10% of you are a particular minority, you can be um, abused by utilitarianism. So this happens in some Asian countries where there's a 10% minority, all the laws are set to reward the majority, the 60 to 70% of people by taking it away from the small minority. So that is not equality. Cool, so I hope that helps. So virtue is your character, what you should be, not just what you should do. So if someone was gonna describe you, would they say, oh, this person is really courageous, this person has lots of integrity, uh, credibility, these kinds of words describe who you are, not just what you do. And if you read the APS 110 Code of Ethics, one of the key ones is integrity linked to honesty, acting with objective, uh, objectivity, acting with ethical courage. So when, you know, when Jamie is asked to cheat with the computers, Jamie has the courage to say, no, I cannot do that. It would be dishonest and uh, compromising my integrity. But also we want empathy and compassion. 
could a helpful attitude. So what's the right character is another concept in there as well. So what we've looked at is this, this roadmap. Now, when you read the study guide, I hope having this image in your mind and some stories will help it just sink in that little bit faster. You get a question in the exam, you'll answer it uh, more quickly. But what happens when we get conflict? How, how do we resolve it? So we have utilitarianism, we have rights. What if, what if you believe in, well, I believe in utilitarianism and you believe in rights? Let's, let's have a look at this example. Okay, so there's a fellow in China and he built himself a five-story house. It's a bit wobbly, but it was his house and he liked it a lot. And then the government wanted to put a road through. And in the first instance, he refused. So they actually just built the road and then just sort of went around the house. Should this fellow have his house torn down? What do you think? If it was your house, what would you say? And once again, there's no right answer. We're looking here at the tension between different people saying this is right. No, I'm right. No, you're right. People have gone shy again. What do you think you should do? What would you do if you were the person? And what would you do if you were the government? And, and it's important here to not just say, I reckon you should do this or you should do that. Why? And what's your framework? So what I'm trying to do is link your gut feelings to the theory that you're seeing on the page. Someone's asked for a replacement house. That's a great strategy. So you could say, you can tear my house down, but build me something just as good next door. Okay. Someone would say, yeah, self-interest. My ethical egoism, my self-interest says, go away. This is my property. Based on utilitarianism, he should move. That's exactly right. So what we're seeing here, and, and now imagine I could ask this exam question from any perspective. Ethical egoism. I am not letting you take my house. Utilitarianism, tear the house down. Rights theory, right to property is, is important. So it should be respected. Equality, what's good for the greatest number of people? Well, one person holding up all his area when they could be moved to the side, that's a problem. So you consider it from all of these different scenarios. And look, that's exactly what the government did. The government said, we'll pay you money. He said, no. Finally, they said, well, we're going to pay you money or we're just going to tear the house down. So in the end, he gave up. They tore the house down and they built the road. Now, you could put this on the news and say, look how evil the government is. But the government could technically argue that they were ethically based on utilitarianism. Now, you would hope that this person received some compensation and something to reward them because this was taken away. In many, in many countries, in many situations, people get taken off their land. If it's good farming land, they just get taken off and it gets given to, to others. So there is there's often abuses here. But what we have now is theories or frameworks that you can use to evaluate an ethical dilemma or situation. All right, so how do you master all these areas in more detail? We have short video clips on all of these. So ethical egoism, we've got a, a five minute clip. Restricted egoism, it's a two minute clip. Then we've got a, a case study linked to um, McDonald's, so you get to read that. Then you get to know, watch one on utilitarianism. And we have clips on teleological, then deontological, then the code of ethics, then resolving issues. So you can see that we have short videos that map you all the way through the, the study guide. And we've actually just been updating module one and module two. So it actually says, Watch these videos, now go and read these 10 pages, now do this, now try this. So, so what we're trying to do is create like a tutorial plan structure. If you just work through that and sign it off week after week, you'll, you'll get to the end and, and that's the aim. So what we want to do is just keep you, keep you consistently on track. Applying APS 1 on Euro. I don't want to talk much about this tonight, but just show you what's expected when module two comes. So we have the five key fundamental principles. Integrity, which is linked to being honest and straightforward. Objectivity, this idea of without bias, not being influenced by one party or the other, the impartial spectator. Professional competence, this is why you need a CPA program, learn more technical skill, financial reporting, tax, audit, whatever it might be, you know what you're doing and you do it with enough diligence and care. Professional behaviour, so behaving in a way that upholds the profession, so whether it's in your advertising or your behaviour with clients or how you treat people or your competitors, that's appropriate. And then confidentiality, respecting confidentiality. The only thing I'll say tonight is this is the biggest ethical risk because the people at places like 7-Eleven who knew about it 
they tend to hide behind confidentiality and say, oh, well, I'd love to you know, do something about it, but I'm bound by my ethical obligation to be confidential. That's kind of hiding and chickening out, to be honest. And the new edition of the Code of Ethics that will come out in the next year or so is going to eliminate that, um, that hiding place. From now on, if it's something that's unethical, regardless of confidentiality, you will need to stand up. But based on the current edition, that's where it's at. So we have five principles. And those principles are under threat. They're under threat by our own personal self-interest. So going back to Jamie, Jamie's self-interest was, I don't want to lose my job. I just started today. So Jamie's self-interest is, I am not going to do the right thing. So therefore, Jamie's integrity gets smashed. Uh, Self-review is when you're checking your own work. So auditors and people like that can face problems. Familiarity is when you can get too close to someone, you build a, a strong relationship like family, and then it's hard to be objective, isn't it? So if you know someone really well, how do you review them objectively? Uh, they, they're your friend, they're your brother, they're your sister. How do, you, how do you fire them or hold them accountable or tell them those facts? Intimidation can make us very scared and it can also make us lose these, these fundamental principles. So we have these principles we need to uphold and we have these threats to those principles that challenge us and could make us uh, act unethically. We have safeguards and someone mentioned this in the chat box earlier. So how do we protect ourselves? So we have good corporate oversight and competent staff and leadership. So hopefully there's an audit committee or a whistleblowing hotline or some way, someone at the right level you can go and talk to and say, here are some problems. And encouraging bad news as well as good news. There, there's some companies the culture is never share bad news. Don't tell the bosses or they'll just glower at you. Uh, then on top of the code of ethics with the, the key principles and the threats, if you're in public practice, there's more rules and requirements. Now, we'll, we'll talk through these in about week three, week four. And if you're a member in business, the same thing. So, for example, you have to prepare reports with an independent kind of perspective in mind. You cannot just do what your bosses tell you. You cannot just publish results that make it look good, even when it's not. You have to act with objectivity and competence. And you have to avoid receiving too many inducements or gifts because that will compromise your objectivity. How can you be independent when someone just gave you a $10,000 gift? That's why politicians are always monitored so carefully in that area. So to conclude module two, we use these dilemmas. Uh, to, we evaluate dilemmas using models. So we move from remembering the, the ethical description. So yes, you might remember deontological and teleological, but can you actually apply them and evaluate an ethical issue because this is the level of your CPA exam. It's quite tough because you have to read a case or two and then write answers and evaluation. So it's not just remembering the study guide. So four areas you need to be skillful at, you need to be able to use APS 110. So, so an exam question could be, read this two pages of text. Now evaluate the ethical issues using APS 110 or GM40 or the AAA model or the philosophical model. You don't know which one you might be asked, so you have to know all of them. And, and we give you practice exams that, that help you with that so you can um, answer those questions. So the first one is the conceptual framework approach. Remember those threats that we saw, self-interest, advocacy, familiarity, intimidation? What are those threats? And can we put safeguards in place that protect us from harming the fundamental principles, integrity, objectivity, confidentiality, due care, whatever it might be? And if we can't, and this might happen to Jamie, you might have to resign, have decline, walk away. So that's our conceptual framework approach. So you can see the structure step by step by step to get you to a conclusion. And that's how you earn your marks in an exam question. The AAA model, seven questions that balances teleological and deontological. So we look at uh, what are the best norms, principles, and values? So values link to things like justice theory, principles, fundamental principles, like integrity and objectivity. Consequences, that's clearly teleological. Focus on outcomes rather than intentions. Uh, norms, principles, values, once again, intentions as well. So we're balancing all the ethical theories together and we end up, hopefully, with the right decision. So that's the AAA model. And I'll be emailing out detailed cases which you then read and use the seven steps to prepare an answer. So 
that's what I said about actually writing answers and being really up to date and, and confident with the material. The philosophical model, four questions, combines teleological and deontological together. So one question for each of the three. Is it better for oneself? Better for others? So utilitarianism. Have we considered everyone's rights? And have we distributed the benefits and burdens fairly? So today was a rapid fire review of these key areas, and we'll go over these again. We spent two weeks on module two, so don't don't panic if it didn't all sink in. It, it's just supposed to expose you to it. So now you'll go and watch the short videos. In a week or two, you'll read this module, and and it'll just start making more and more sense so that you're very familiar. Then we start giving you more practice questions. So by the time you get to your exam, you are just well on track to a, to a great result. So what we have, ethics, then theories. And today we, we focus most of our time here. So deontological and teleological theories. So what is ethics? This idea of distinguishing between right and wrong. Then how do we do that? Well, we use ethical egoism, justice theory, utilitarianism, right theory. Uh, virtue ethics, the code of ethics, the five key principles and the five main traits, how to make good decisions using ethical decision making models. That's module two. And uh, what we'll do on next Monday night, I want to jump into a particular area of trade practices or now it's in module four, but don't panic, it stands alone. You don't need to read any of module one, two or three for this to make sense. And the reason I want to focus here is We've looked at ethical issues. This one is a legal issue. So I want to show you how we address a legal question. And if you remember back to your university studies, IRAC, what's the issue, what's the relevant law, apply to the case study, uh, case study and, and come to a conclusion. So I want to see, show you the IRAC method because uh, you know I spent a good 10 years as a CPA uh, examiner and it's very frustrating to find students who've done the work and know the answers but get no marks because they, they just don't write enough information, they don't address the key points. So I want to show you good structure so you get the best marks based on your efforts and your outcomes. So uh, that pretty much brings us to the end of tonight. As I said, uh, that's the winter school timetable. And then we just keep going. So from now on until October, we meet every Monday night from seven till eight. And uh, you're welcome to attend. You're welcome to just watch the recording when it comes out. Keep an eye on emails. If you need to send me a question, edacknowledgeequity.com.au. Here are more of our contact details. And, and all of these slides are available inside the Winter School Unit. So you can download the slide, you can use the Facebook link, the email link, the inquiries link, however it works. So just before I finish, I do want to address this question because a lot of people ask me, why is ethics and governance free? What's the catch? When are you going to try and sting me for some money? Uh, and the answer is, it's just free. We give you the, the full ethics and governance experience and, and there's logic behind that. So uh, we have four different levels of, of courses across the CPA program. So CPA Assist is free. It's like our free trial, has about 10 hours of content. Revision Plus is a basic uh, model, exam ready and full focus are similar. Exam ready has recorded webinars, full focus you come to the live ones. And uh, then what we have from there is, uh, so for example, if you do exam ready, you get practice exams, as well as roughly 50 or 60 video tutorials, the 10 webinars, all of these things sequenced together and, and full focus. Now, if you've never seen us before, or you don't know what to experience, we want you to get on board, see if you'd like us for your first subject, because we're confident you'll then say, oh, I like it, I'll stick around for my next five subjects. And then we're gonna say, well, then you've checked us out, you know if you can trust us, you like our content, it helped you do well, I'm gonna stick around. That's easier than trying to convince people to sign up um, if they're not sure if it's for them. So that's, the, that's why we do it. There's six subjects in the program, we give one away free and we hope you'll stick around for the other five. Uh, if you're doing ethics and governance, your first subject, you don't need to pay anything now. Our, we have our, our cheapest prices in the future. So if you want to check out or you're doing two subjects, whatever it might be, this is the type of pricing we have in place for exam ready and full focus. Um, as we say, if you if you do like, for example, a five pack of exam ready, that's pretty much the same price as one CPA subject. So we, we never uh, charge again. If you do a subject with us and you defer or you fail, we, um, 
we don't make you pay for the whole unit again. You'll just have a, a $30 rollover fee. So we, we, we don't make money unless you get through. That's the, that's the focus of what we do. So any more questions on that, I'll open up the chat box, but that, that's um, the key area. I just want to see if I can bring up one slide to show you. Uh, let me see. I just want to show you this because people are going to ask, where do I find the recording and where do I find the PDF? So if you log into our system, so you just go to knowledgeequity.com.au and you log in, you'll see ethics and governance main course. When you go into that course, this is something we added in yesterday. It's called Winter School. So Winter School EG 2017 has just appeared. And inside, so session one, as Chris is recording from Saturday, this here, the recording from today will be up within a couple of hours. And these the PowerPoint slides are actually already available. So if you want to download what I talked through, have a look at them, use them to start building your summary notes, that's where they are. The other thing is we emailed you out these instructions, but the instructions for week three are already available. So each week you can you can read ahead and go, what do I need to read? What do I need to do? So for example, this week you only have to read 13 pages, watch the short videos, and off you go. Next week, dive into about 10 pages of module four, and off you go again. So we and then here you can just see accountants as professionals, regulation and judgment. We have four units. Each of them takes about 30 minutes to work through. So in two hours, you, you're going to make it through module one. And then when you read it, it's just going to stick in your mind because you're going to have all these images, all these stories, and uh, we think you'll, you'll learn really well. So thank you for, for attending. I hope you found that useful. I'm going to close the webinar now, but you, you can stay in the room for a couple of minutes and ask your questions. Happy to answer any questions. But for those of you who want to you know, get on with your Monday night, uh, have a great night. Cool, thanks.